Linda Bonato, who is here uh, present today and who will be discussing translating transgender in 18th century Europe, the mediating ecosystem of transmission, reworking, and the circulation of the brief story of Katarina Vizan. We just have a few minutes to uh, upload the, uh, the paper, the presentation. No, this one and this one also. Yes. Okay, great. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I would um, um, like to thank um, all of the organizers here, Monica, Maria, Laura, Inma, for all of your, and all of the other people. I know this was a huge enterprise, and I'm so happy to be here after two years of sitting on my couch. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. In 1744, Italian anatomist Giovanni Bianchi, Yes. Oh, there. Yes. Uh, there. Okay, great. All right. So it's thank you very much. Italian anatomist uh, Giovanni Bianchi, who you see here to the left, wrote a short story about transgender, and you can see the manuscript to the right. Breve storia di Caterina Vizzani, or brief history of uh, Caterina Vizzani. Um, Here is the uh, full Italian title, and my um, translation uh, of the title into English. Um, the story is, for those of you who are in English literature, it's primarily known through its English translation, which is really an adaptation uh, by John Cleland, first published in 17. Uh, this is the title page of the original, and here are um, Here are uh, the two editions done by John Cleland um, in 1751 and 1756. Um, so even though Giovanni Bianchi, and then of course also Cleland in his translation, only include the pre-transition name of the protagonist, Caterina Vizzani, in the title, a few pages into the story, we are introduced to the transitioned person, Giovanni Bordoni. What distinguishes this story from a mere tale of cross-dressing or uh, disguised identity is Giovanni Bianchi's grafting of a scientific event, the autopsy of Caterina Giovanni's body, with Giovanni Bordoni's life story, plus the infusion of the doctor Giovanni Bianchi's story as well. Thus, science biography and autobiography merge in narrative. Doctors don't usually tell stories, although some had begun to include lifestyle and diet in their evaluation of a person's illness. Yet Bianchi, in sync with his Dutch anatomist forebears, De Haft, uh, Leuvenhoek, and Swammerdam, No, no. There they are. Um, there was a close connection in the kinds of research they did. That's a, another whole paper. Um, like them, he wasn't looking to condemn a non-traditional sexuality, but rather to understand the workings of lust and desire that operated psychologically, emotionally, physically, and genetically in what he considered to be one of the many natural expressions of desire and identity, 
that of transgender. So central is this intention to his motivation for writing the story that he opens the novella with it. Quote, truly strange and remarkable. So this is my translation. It's not what John Cleland wrote. <laughs> this is already <laughs> sensationalized you here. But this is what Bianchi wanted to say. Truly strange and remarkably incredible are at times human appetites, especially in matters of love. Therefore, no one should be surprised if some people only hearing about the fire of love are at times so inflamed that they go wandering through various and distant lands to try to possess at last the object of their desire. Thus, it is no wonder if at times some are so powerfully inflamed by this very fire, whether through twisted or proper pathways that neither class nor parentage, nor gender may impede the satisfying of that appetite to the extent they are able." Close quote. I have written about this novella and its shared history with John Cleland's translation in my monograph, The Life and Legend of Katerina Vizzani, Sexual Identity, Science, and Sensationalism in 18th Century Italy and England. But today I wish to take a closer look at the mediastic moment of Vizzani Bordoni by examining the German language review of Bianchi's text, its translation into German based on Cleland's English translation, and the defense mounted by the editors of the journal that published it in response to reader complaints over the printing of such a schmutzige Geschichte, a dirty story. <laughs> the translation of these texts became the primary means of their circulation and a foundational element of the transnational 18th century. Translation allows us to study texts their afterlife, and their new life in different translated forms and contexts beyond the local one from which they first emerged. In this paper, we will consider the story and history of Caterina Giovanni, uh, Vizzani Giovanni Bordoni in the translating of transgender in 18th century Europe and the evolution of Vizzani Bordoni's life story and reception as it traveled from England, from Italy to England and then to Germany. We take as our inspiration Heike Bauer's assessment of the body of scholarship on the histories of sexuality that she expressed in the introduction to her edited collection, Sexology and Translation, Cultural and Scientific Encounters Across the Modern World. Quote, yet what is missing, still missing from the growing body of scholarship on the histories of sexuality in different parts of the world is a deep understanding of the comparative transnational or global dimensions of modern sexology." Close quote. Now, as I've said, the story achieved its notoriety and something of the status of a classic on the representation of Sapphism. That's how it was originally read, although I read it as a case of transgender. Um, I argue this extensively in my book, um, but it's with, thanks to John Cleland, the world knew about it. That's the way I found out about it. In all likelihood, the text way that's made, made its way from uh, to England uh, through Bianchi's close friend, Antonio Cocchi, there's Cocchi in Florence, a member of the first Italian Masonic Lodge and physician to Horace Walpole, and the British ex and there's Walpole and the British expats residing in Florence or coming through on the grand tour. Cleland, author of Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, better known as Fanny Hill, had a penchant for combining sexual content with social commentary, as is evident to any reader of Fanny Hill. And the story of Caterina Vizzani offered him an enticing second act. Yet the short title of his translation, A Historical and Physical Dissertation on the Case of Caterina Vizzani, demonstrates from the outset Cleland's desire to focus on the body 
rather than the life story. In my monograph mentioned above, I've explored some of the issues characterizing the cultural, linguistic, and physiological dichotomies between the Italian and English telling of Vizzani Bordoni's transgendered life, as well as offer a new translation of the novella, one that tries to echo Bianchi's original and the interest in using the didactic mode of narrative to share his ideas on the science and social science of gender and sexual preference. Cleland, as we know, with his many sensationalizing asides and comments about Italian taste, this was a story that could only take place in Italy, right? The depraved sexual nation of Italy and the sexual mores of those living in warm climates, not to mention his mock horror over Caterina uh, Giovanni's dildo, which he called the leathering machine. And here, here is a picture of a leathering machine from a 18th century French convent. <laughs> but um, it, for, for um, Cleland, this was proof of Caterina's imposture. In contrast with Bianchi's recognizing of the self-fashioned penis as a body part that corresponds to Caterina's transition to Giovanni and in Bianchi's text, a switch to male pronouns, a transfer that never happens in Cleland's translation, where the pronouns are she and her, the only ones ever used even after the transition to Giovanni Bordone. So this is really the case of um, sex and translation, and I, I, I've written about that extensively in my book. In today's paper, I would like to extend this analysis to the German translation of the novella and a further transnational consideration of transgender through translation, now across yet another language and culture, allowing for an analysis of the telescoping of discourses about transgender in the Vizzani Bordoni story as perceived by different translators and sociosexual trans traditions. First, a summary of the story, of the true story, which the author ascertained through his colleagues in Rome. At the age of 14, Caterina Vizzani, a Roman adolescent, daughter of a carpenter, was caught in the arms of her best friend and lover, Margherita, by Margherita's father, who threatens legal action. Caterina flees, changing her name to Giovanni Bordoni and dresses like a man. A leather dildo is permanently worn the way, um, uh, physically, is the way that Caterina transitions to Giovanni, the most complete trans transition before surgery that Caterina could make. Bianchi then tells us of Bordoni's ribald reputation as the best lover in town wherever he goes, but also his desire to marry the niece of his boss, an official in the town of Librapata, his last place of employment. He wants to bring the woman he loves to Rome to meet his parents, whom we have learned over the course of the story, except and support the transgendered status of their offspring. Now, the sister of the woman he wants to marry, who also wants to get away from her annoying uncle, talks Giovanni into bringing her to Rome, too. They leave early one morning, but are sidelined by the breakdown of their carriage. By the time it is repaired, the uncle and his thugs catch up with them. One of the henchmen shoots Giovanni in the leg. Giovanni is taken to the hospital, where he is checked into the men's ward, and, as Bianchi carefully instructs the reader, tended to by a group of nuns in charge. When it is clear he is going to die, Bordoni comes out to the nuns, telling him that he was born Caterina Vizzani and is a virgin. The nuns, completely ignoring the dildo, <laughs> celebrate female virginity, interpreting the dildo in men's clothes as a mere ruse for protecting female virginity over the eight-year period Vizzani Bordoni was on the road. Bordoni is thus buried as Vizzani and hailed a virgin, brought back into the fold of the Catholic Church. Now, in my blog post for the book, I have compared the death and murder of, Bord of Bordoni as uh, trans um, uh, uh, to a, the number of trans killings that take place today every year. 
And I've likened Bordoni's misgendering and dead naming to what happens today when a transgender person is killed or dies and the gender of birth and birth name are always indicated in all official documentation and obituaries rather than the transition name and identity. So let's move on to the, um, the, the German translation. There are four instances of the Katerina Vizani story in German, all four of which appear in German periodicals. And here you can see um, them outlined, and I will go through them uh, very quickly. Um, so we have the review of uh, Bianchi's original text, we have um, a review of the first edition of Cleland's translation. And in the fifth volume of the Allgemeines Magazin der Naturkunst und Wissenschaft, a German translation of Cleland's English um, translation, uh, and published with the Austen English and Übersetz, or translated from the English clearly indicated. And finally, in the same periodical, a response by the editors to irate letters from the readers. And here you can see, I'll just go through this very quickly, but here are the actual German uh, texts. Um, so um, we might wonder why this novella garnered so much attention in Germany. There are two immediate answers to this question. The first one being the strong ties that linked German and Italian intellectuals throughout the century. The correspondence between uh, Bianchi and Albrecht von Haller was copious, and Bianchi probably sent him copies of his novella. But the other has to do with one of the most famous trials of a transgendered person, person in the 18th century, that of Katharina Margherita Link, or Anastasius Rosenstengel a Prussian woman who died by hanging in 1721 for transforming her body with a dildo, adopting a male name and transitioning to a man as Vizzani would do some 20 years later. Link's trial documents raise the hotly debated issue of what constitutes a sexual crime when a dildo is used to penetrate a woman. Here you can see a graphic novel of her story um, published by German comic book artist and illustrator, Elke R. Steiner. 17th century Franciscan Ludovico Maria Sinistrati, author of a treatise, the most absolute treatise of crime and punishment, of which one section is about sodomy and often uh, published separately, included a discussion of the sodom, and this is interesting because it's been republished many times, as you can tell from the modern um, book covers. Um, sodomitical acts of women with large clitorises or dildos used to penetrate other women anally. The crime, if they used a dildo, was not a crime, but if they used a, 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 a clitoris, yes. This was all debated in Link's case, printed in the write-up of the trial. And so she, uh, Link, for most of her life, was presented, had presented as a man. She married a woman and based on their sexual activity together was convicted of sodomy and executed. Link's execution was the last for lesbian sexual activity in Europe, but really Link is, is transsexual, is, is transgendered too, I would argue, and an anomaly for its time. The mother of her female husband, Mrs. Mulhan, and I'm quoting from the documents, quote, charged the defendant with being a woman, not a man ripped open her pants, examined her, and found not the slightest sign of anything masculine. <laughs> Mulhan's mother provided the authorities with the artificial penis along with a leather-covered leather horn that Link wore next to her body, which constituted part of her male disguise, allowing her, but, but him, because he took a different name too, to urinate standing up. We are reminded of uh, Katarina Giovanni's leather dildo and the view of imposture espoused by Cleland, in contrast with the transgender status of both Link and Vizzani Bordoni. However, as stated earlier, the most striking aspect of the Vizzani Bordoni story in Germany is the response of the editors of the periodical Allgemeines Magazin der Naturkunst und Wissenschaft to readers who wrote to complain about the dirty story. 
They argue that the story is no more dirty than old medical books and anatomical diagrams of the body that the public was wont to consult and look at, often for titillation. Instead, the editors ask their readership to extend empathy to Vizzani Bordoni and to consider the heart of the transgendered person and to expand their understanding of human gender. They state that as editors, it is their duty to decide what should be published in the interest of sparking debate and contributing to the discussion of moral philosophy. The editors cite the didactic purpose of their journal. This is my translation and I, I'm ending with this. We have indicated the conditions, quote, we have indicated the conditions under which we want to choose our pieces insofar as they are to serve mainly for instruction. There is still one intention left which cannot be neglected in books of this kind. People want as much to satisfy their desire for novelty, to enhance their pleasure, and to be instructed. If this can happen through a knowledge of things that concern the art of nature or science, then they belong to the scope of things that should be found in our journal. This must never be done without the intention of instruction, but the satisfaction of a praiseworthy curiosity, the great driving force of all human knowledge, and the promotion of a permissible pleasure still to be the main intention. By way of exception, we reserve the right to include in our magazine, for the above-mentioned reason, such writings. Finally, we do not allow any scholar in the world, no matter how high his merits, to imagine that he can choose and communicate anything but that which serves as a model and consists of pure truths." Close quote. Giovanni Bianchi would have been pleased to read this defense of his work by editors whose intention in translating and disseminating the Vizzani Bordoni novella perfectly matched his intention in writing it. Thank you very much.